by the shore and outside and at the beaches. I then kind of moved not too far, about two hours north to Worcester, Massachusetts, um, to a, a really phenomenal place, which is where I've, I've really grown my love of chemistry and science. And um, I've just been given a lot of opportunities in the research lab. So I just, at the work that I've, I'm presenting today is not what I do at Holy Cross, but I wanted to give a shout out to Holy Cross for really setting me up very well for, you know, my next steps in graduate school. And then like Nyan said, you guys kind of might be wondering how I, I got here today, but we met out at the University of Minnesota this summer um, doing research in, you know, organic chemistry labs. And I was in the Hoy lab and he was in the Pomerantz lab just down the hall. So we got a lot of, uh, we got to talk a lot and share really cool chemistry. So um, that's kind of how I ended up speaking to you guys today. <clears throat> so then I, I guess enough about me, but let's jump into the chemistry. Um, so before we get into the, you know, very powerful reactivity of allenes, I think it's important to take a moment and just discuss you know, what is an allene? Um, I'll give you a hint that they're color coded in blue on most of my slides. Um, but what kind of reactivity they have, what their shape is, um, what they look like and how to identify one. So on the screen, I've shown just a very generic example of an allene. And by definition, an allene is a molecule which has two carbon carbon double, double bonds which share a single SP carbon in the center of it. Um, so we can see that we have one double bond here, one double bond on this side, and then this is our single SP carbon right in the middle. But you know the structure shown on the screen can be a little bit deceiving actually, because it kind of shows the molecule as being flat, um, a very planar like structure, but actually one of the great advantages of allenes as intermediates is that they have this really fascinating 3D shape. So instead of being just a flat planar molecule, they actually have um, one kind of pi bond that's coming in and out of the plane of the board, as we can see on this left side carbon here with our wedges and our dashes. And then perp perpendicular to this pi bond here, we have our pi bond that's in the plane of the board. So as my research advisor here in the United States always tells us to do, if you have a molecular model kit, um, it, it would might be very advantageous to make a make a model of these compounds and really convince yourself of this shape. Because <laughs> this 3D shape is really what allows allenes to be a common intermediate in the building of these very structurally complex and chiral molecules. So then why are allenes so important? Um, they are very important intermediates in reactivity, and that's kind of what I'll be talking about in the work that I did this summer. But there's also allenes in the final product of many bioactive molecules. Um, so I've, I've labeled just a few of them up on the screen here that have been isolated from nature or synthesized by a pharmaceutical company that have really um, amazing properties. Um, and I just wanted to highlight the one on the left there, grasshopper ketone, which is a natural product isolated from a brown algae. And it's been um, recently studied a lot for its anti-inflammatory properties. Um, also the fomoalenic acid B is a bacterial fatty acid synthase inhibitor, which is a really great antimicrobial um, for some very common bacterias, including influenzae and um, even E. coli. <clears throat> And then citrus side A here is a natural product. Um, and it has been suggested that it can be a possible um, treatment for some skin diseases such as A to B. And then we have on all the way on the right here, we have um, scorodonin, which is actually a naturally occurring antibiotic. And it's been shown that it can um, decrease the, the growth of bacteria and yeasts and fungi. So, a lot of these molecules um, <clears throat> have some very fascinating applications in biology. So now that we kind of understand what an allene is and why they're important and how they're present in these biomolecules and pharmaceuticals, the next kind of question that 
we, we all might be wondering is how do allines react? So once they're in the body, what kind of reactions can they do? Or in situ, if you're setting up a reaction, what kind of properties do they have? So although allines um, can do a, a multitude of very fascinating catalytic reactions and radical crossovers, um, because of this like culminated diene structure, uh, t I, today, I really want to attempt to prove to you how prevalent and widely versed they, their reactivity is by just focusing on some like very basic organic chemistry reactions that allines participate in all the time. So these aren't any crazy, you know, inorganic transition metal deorbital catalyzed reactions, but rather reactions that we've been learning just since day one of organic chemistry. <clears throat> Uh, the first of these reactions is just an electrophilic addition to an allene, which is very analogous to electrophilic additions to alkenes, as you can imagine. Um, we can also see some fascinating intramolecular cyclization reactions happening with allenes and uh, a tethered intramolecular nucleophile. And then the, the reactivity that I'm very passionate about of, of allenes is, are these cycloadditions of allenes. And more specifically, I'll, I'll be talking about the tri-DDA cycloaddition. So our first type of allene reactivity is this electrophilic addition reaction. So if we take this generic allene here on the left-hand corner of the screen, Let's think about an electrophile in situ being able to react with this right pi bond. We can imagine that it might either add to our yellow asterisk carbon or our green asterisk carbon. From there, we get these two products here, our carbocationic species. And upon addition of a nucleophile to our flask, we can get these two regioisomers here. But if we choose to react at our other carbon, now highlighted with the green asterisk on the left and still our yellow asterisk in the center, upon an addition of electrophile, we would get these two possible cations. <clears throat> and then again, nucleophilic attack in situ can give us these two regioisomers here. All of these molecules creating uh, that were created have new chirality and um, different regioisomeric structures. So this can really show how allenes can give us access to um, some fascinating chiral centers. And uh, even from our simplest type of allene right here, we can get four regioisomers that are structurally very complex and different. So it's, it's very fascinating reactivity. Uh, the other type of reactivity, the, the second type was our cyclization reactions. So here I have a, just another generic allene on our screen. And we can imagine that if we have some nucleophile tethered by a, a chain of just length N, like a generic chain length, we can imagine that this nucleophile might use its electrons to attack any one of the carbons on this allene. Um, and it would just depend on our, our Baldwin rules of ring closures to imagine which attack would be most favorable. <clears throat> Upon attack, we would then get this carboanionic species with our closed ring structures. And upon a, a simple addition of an electrophile, we can get this, this great um, final cyclized product here. Okay, so that was kind of a quick run through of the two, um, two of the types of, of allene reactivity. But now I really wanna focus in on what I think is very fascinating, um, the cycloadditions of allenes, and, and more specifically the tri-DDA 4 plus 2 cycloaddition, which I have worked with pretty extensively um, this summer and even in the weeks um, in, the, uh, in this past semester, just virtually through uh, Zoom meetings. So before I kind of talk about what the tri-DDA reaction is, um, it's the tridehydro deals alder reaction. So I think it's important to note why um, deals alder reactivity is important, what deals alder reactivity is, and then we can get into kind of the nuts and bolts of how this tridda reaction is different um, and more powerful and the like. So 
The Deal's Alder reaction was coined as one of the most powerful synthetic organic reactions by Nobel laureate R.B. Woodward in 1965 when he won his Nobel Prize. Um, and so the Diels Alder reaction is so important because it, it allows us access to so many unique organic scaffolds of cyclic compounds, which have different degrees of unsaturation. And it, it just provides a very um, fast and selective and well-known avenue into such a wide array of substrates. So then just in case it's been a while since our intro chemistry courses, um, to go over a quick reminder of what the Diels Alder reaction is. The Diels Alder reaction is a net four plus two cycloaddition between some diene, which is a dialkene. So it means it has two pi bonds in it. And then some dienophile, which is often a two pi system. This four plus two cycloaddition gives us access to some six membered ring with a degree of unsaturation in it. So the tri-DDA reaction is still a net four plus two cycloaddition, but rather bet than between a diene and a dienophile, we now have a diene, so a dialkyne, and then we have some dienophile, which as I've shown on the screen is an alkene, but it can also be any array of aryl groups which is actually what I've worked with pretty extensively. <clears throat> so this um, substrate here will undergo a deprotonation, which gets us to our signature allene intermediate, and then can go to our desired aromatic ring structure. So that was kind of a, a quick overview of tridda reaction and kind of its signature um, pieces that we're looking for, that dialkyne, um, a place for deprotonation to get to our, our allene intermediate. But I just kind of want to orient you right now with this substrate that I have on the top left corner of the screen here, which is what I've worked with um, pretty extensively. So we can see that it has that characteristic of the dialkyne. So there's one alkyne or nitrile up here, an alkyne right here. And then it has a spot alpha to our um, bottom alkyne where we can get deprotonation and tautomerization to our allene intermediate. To so to show you how that works, we can imagine that there's two propargilic hydrogens at this position right here, which can undergo, one can undergo a deprotonation to form this anionic species here. This hydrogen will then tautomerize to give us our signature allene intermediate. This allene will then undergo our four plus two cycloaddition and another hydrogen tautomerization to give us our aromatic pr products here on the right. So that is kind of the mechanism of what's happening with this tridda reaction. It's very similar to a, a traditional Diels-Alder, but it, it now affords us access to aromatic structures, which as we know in chemistry are very stable, um, prevalent in so many different pharmaceutical molecules, biomolecules and the like. So this new method of accessing these substrates has become you know, the kind of at the forefront of its field. So then, you know, I think it's important to kind of go through what kind of substrates we were able to synthesize and what we learned about this reactivity via this substrate scope. So the first thing that the first substrate that we we tried to synthesize was this cyclized product here, where you can imagine it's coming from this diene precursor, where this AR group right here is just a phenyl ring. We were able to isolate this at room temperature in greater than an 85% yield, no problem. Um, so the proof of concept that these intramolecular aryl groups act at, that can act as good dienophiles, um, it, it really does work quite well. And so then the next thing that we kind of tried to do was a, a competition experiment between now a group that is electron poor, this benzonitrile here, and a group that is electron rich, this aniline derivative over here. So we did find that um, in their own reaction flasks, each of them cyclizes uh, the aniline derivative needing a little bit of heat to get there. But when we put them all in one NMR tube and just added addition of the TBD base, we actually found that um, 
through some very fascinating NMR spectra that this electron poor species cyclizes rapidly while this aniline derivative over here takes a while and needs a little bit, um, I think a gentle heat of about 60 degrees uh, Celsius to be able to cyclize. And our, our fennel ring was kind of in the middle somewhere. It wasn't super fast that we couldn't observe it, but it, it wasn't so slow that we needed to heat it. And this is kind of a, a non-shocking result, right? It supports our qualitative understanding that an electron group at this position would make our propargillic hydrogens more electron poor, which makes them um, more acidic. And this would lead to our faster alkyne to alene isomerization. So this kind of makes sense with what we were thinking, right? As our, our nitrogen here can donate electron density into this ring, it's making it harder for our, our propargillic um, hydrogens to be deprotonated, which take, means it takes a little bit longer. The, the next substrate that we tried synthesizing was this toluene derivative here, where we really wanted to test the tri-DDA regioisomeric selectivity. And um, so we chose just a very minor sterically hindering group, this methyl group here, to see if we got regioisomeric selectivity or if we got one-to-one -one mixtures. And even with just this small sterically hindering group here, like a methyl, we found complete regioselectivity. So we got no, we had, we isolated no, none of the other um, possible cyclized product, which is very exciting because you can imagine that the more control you have over your reactivity, the more um, exciting it's gonna be and the more useful it will be in the, the synthesis of larger products, larger natural products or pharmaceuticals or the like. And then the final substrate that we tried was here was just a, a furan ring. And this kind of study showed that, uh, you know, heteroaromatics are also compatible with this type of reactivity um, and they can be cyclized at room temperature, no problem. And so this kind of wraps up the introductory study of what possible substrate classes we're able to make with these tri-DDA cyclizations. Um, and then we kind of did two other experiments in this work about under, just to understand a little bit more about our, our reactivity. So the next thing that we did was a really fascinating double cyclization. So we have a, a para-substituted um, benzene ring right here with one linker to our left and one linker to our right. Um, so we can see that this molecule has a degree of symmetry within it. So let's hold that our left linker here, this nitrile will always cyclize onto our blue asterisk, while on the right here, this nitrile can either cyclize onto our yellow asterisk or our green asterisk. So via these two possible cyclizations, we can imagine that we either get a horseshoe-shaped regioisomer or a linear-shaped regioisomer. And we actually found some really fascinating results that this horseshoe-shaped uh, regioisomer is actually favored in about a four-to-one ratio to the linear regioisomer. And this might this is a pretty a very surprising preference because we can imagine that this horseshoe shape here is actually incredibly more sterically hindered. We can imagine these methyl groups are kind of pointing at each other and these, these nitrogen lone pairs are kind of pushing at each other. So you wouldn't presume that this is the favorable confirmation of cyclization. And especially with data from uh, like intramolecular friedel crafts or fischer naparowski or Nazarov reactions where they pretty much always see the linear cyclization, this is, this is really kind of shocking. And so my graduate student mentor, Nicholas, really studied this in some pretty in-depth DF, DFT calculations. Um, and I am going to admit to you that as an undergraduate, I, I don't fully understand the, the calculations themselves, but the gist of what we found was that the difference in activation barriers between this cyclization and our linear cyclization is about one kilocal per mole. 
which aligns pretty perfectly with our four to one selectivity. So kind of shocking, but, you know, really fascinating. And again, pretty selective for regioisomeric um, uh, purity. And then the, the last kind of experiment that we did in this work was to, um, rather than form our alene in an adjacent pi system to our aryl group here, rather let's change it to a pendant alene and then have our, have our um, cyclization have to happen onto our aryl group down here. So as we can imagine, um, now we have our, our two propargilic hydrogens up on the top there, which are not as acidic as they would be if we were using this, these two hydrogen, um, if the hydrogens were still down here on the bottom, right? And this kind of makes sense because these hydrogens that we usually use down on the bottom right here are in conjugation and in residence, resonance with this aryl group. So electron density is being pulled away from them, which is making them inherently more acidic. Now we're using hydrogens that only have the resonance into this, al uh, this alkyne right here, which is, they're not as acidic, so it's not as favorably deprotonated. And we found that actually to form this alene intermediate here, we actually have to heat this pretty vigorously to about 130 degrees Celsius to induce our alene formation. And then from there, once we form this alene, alene um, it, it's a very quick cyclization to our final product. And though it was, um, it took a lot of heat to get to our alene intermediate, we found that all three of these substrates um, cyclized in over an 85% yield, even our, our aniline derivative, just requiring a, li a little bit more heat. Um, for the cyclization aspect of it. So with that, I, I want to thank you guys for listening to me today. Um, it was an absolute honor to be asked by Nyan to come talk to you. Um, and also, I just want to thank my grad student, Nicholas, and my, my PI, Tom, this summer. They really um, helped me grow as a scientist and, and learn how to really um, produce research that is graduate level um, and, and quite impressive. So with that, I would be happy to uh, take any questions that you guys may have. Um, so yeah, thank you. Yeah, and that was really awesome. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just wait for some questions if the audience has, else I have a few and one of my friends just got disconnected. So I'll just ask on his behalf. Absolutely. Just send me the questions. Yeah. So. Anybody here like has some doubts, queries or anything? Yeah, so our traditional deals all the reactivity. Let me find that very quickly. Um, right here on this slide, it only produces this single degree of unsaturation. So we, we don't see formation of our aromatic compounds, um, which was really exci exciting when we did discover this type of reactivity um, that we can produce these, these aromatics. Yeah, of course. Hi. Uh it was nice because I have a silly doubt that uh, how did you explain uh, the form the stereoselectiveness, the selectivity of first two cells that is forming 72 percent? Uh, I'm sorry, I think my Wi Fi cut out there for a second. Do you mind? Uh, no, I think like it's his uh, internet connection, maybe. Uh, hi, Arunam, could you please just write in the chat box? I think your voice is just cracked. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hi, Aaron. Uh, great talk. I I'm kind of curious about your linker. Um, do you need the the night the end mesylate in there to kind of bring down the acidity? Like, what's what was the, the inspiration behind that choice? Uh, good question. So it actually was 
just the fact that those were the um, reagents that we had in lab. So that was the e the most easily synthesizable one at the time. Um, this summer, we also tried a, a series of different ether linkers, which are still kind of in the works. But I think we finally figured out how to get different electronics in the linker as well. Um, but it was kind of just ease of synthesis that led for us to um, use that linker specifically. So uh, we have the question in the chat. So can you mind checking that out? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so this is the um, selectivity that I was talking about. And they, they did a lot of computational studies where they found that um, if you plot it at all on like a reaction coordinate diagram, the, the barrier to our, our horseshoe formation was actually lower um, than the barrier to the transition state of our linear um, cyclization. But that was, it was quite a complex study, so I don't fully know all of the details of that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool. So uh, just in case we don't have any more questions, I would like to ask a few. <laughs> so, so, so I was just wondering, Erin, like uh, when you were talking about the electrophilic additions to allenes, like you say that they were chiral centers, right? So. Uh, uh, Definitely, if you're not using any stereo induction or something, they would be racemic, right? Yes. Okay. So is there like any catalysis or something related to that? Um, um, yes. You can I use different, um, I think you can use different chiral ligands on like a metal catalyst um, to be able to achieve selectivity in chirality with these. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. 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 Chiral allenes. Yes. <laughs> every time they are fun. Yeah, and I had one more question. Uh, actually, from the part where you were talking about the pendant alkynes, the pendant alenes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So there you. Okay, I'll just wait for it to go this way. Yeah. So here, are like these two dimethyl groups. So is it like a geminal dimethyl effect bringing the reactive centers close? Ah. Yeah. Yes. That's cool. Yeah. That's what we found that when we remove that gem dimethyl group, there it gets harder to. Um, for the, the substrate to be in its reactive conformation. So having those there kind of like forces it into that um, that conformation to do the four plus two. That's really cool. Yeah. Okay, so uh, just wait if anyone else has some other questions or, and then we can just thank Erin for the amazing, wonderful talk. Yeah, one of my friends had some comments like uh, he's from a maths major and he was just like fascinated by how linear molecules were turning into cycles. <laughs> he had to leave a bit early though. So I'm just going to that. So it looks like no one else has some questions. And uh, hey, Erin, do you mind if someone else has a question, if he or she drops you an email later oh, on? Oh, that's absolutely, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Cool. I'll share your email with them then. Okay. Yeah. So thank, let's all thank Erin again for agreeing to enlighten us on the alien chemistry. And it was really a wonderful talk. And I'm sure all of us took a lot away from her talk. And just as a reminder, we have a talk tomorrow as well. So tune in and have a good day, Erin. Thank you. Thanks for having me. This was great. Yeah, I'm sure it was great too. Okay, bye-bye.